We have journeyed for the past three weeks together, unpacking Paul's letter to the Romans. Through these weeks, we have considered the hope and encouragement that Paul provided to the Romans as they endured tough times. We have also found that his words provide hope and encouragement for us when we are enduring hardships. We have looked at each of these passages, keeping in mind the context in which they were written. That is what the Romans were experiencing when Paul wrote this letter to the congregation in Rome, the center and the hub of the Roman Empire. This family of faith was a new church, and the letter was composed around 53 CE, so this was only 20 or 30 years after Jesus' death. They didn't have the resources to help them study their faith like we have. They didn't even have the New Testament. The Gospels had yet to be written, and so information was by word of mouth or by letters. Leaders such as Paul wrote to them about theology and how to reconcile the conflicts that arose in their churches and communities. The Roman church was experiencing tension as they attempted to develop their theology regarding Jewish and Gentile Christians and how both groups are reconciled to God, a topic prevalent throughout Paul's letter to the Romans and especially in our passage for today. Looking back at the past three weeks, we can see how we have received hope and encouragement through Paul's words. We have been encouraged by Paul's words telling us that when we are in Christ, we will be forgiven by God, no matter what we have done. We have learned that as those immersed in the Christian life, we have freedom. We are not constrained by the laws found in the Hebrew Bible because Jesus came to say that love of God and neighbor outweighed following the rules. The laws were still good. They provided protection and help for those who followed them, but they were no longer necessary for their relationship with God. We have found hope in Paul's words as they told us that we are united as those who love God, follow Christ, and are inspired by the Holy Spirit. We realize that sometimes we endure suffering collectively because it is pain with a purpose. We endure it because we have hope that the kingdom of God is coming, and we wait for this better world with patience. Not simply sitting around, but working to make it a reality. We found words of comfort in Paul's letter. Words that reminded us that even though situations may make us feel separated from God, there is nothing in all creation, no people, no events, no hardship, that can keep us from God's incredible and unwavering love. And along with that, we took comfort when Paul told us that when the world does feel too overwhelming, when deep sighs are all that we can muster, that they are transformed by the Spirit, and God hears those deep sighs as a prayer. And through all of these hopeful, encouraging, and comforting words from Paul, we were inspired to stand apart from the world, showing our faith to the world. We were inspired to work to help bring the kingdom of God. We were inspired to stand up against that which feels like separation from God. The passage for today picks up immediately after Paul wrote how nothing can separate us from God's love. In today's passage, Paul is once again brought back to the question of how the Jewish and the Gentile Christians were to coexist. 
how both groups were to be reconciled to God and yet live with such differences in their histories. This time, however, there's a slight twist to his ponderings. We hear in these verses a lament. He was devastated that some Jewish people, perhaps even his own family and friends, had not converted. They had not become Jewish Christians. They were still following the law and did not see Christ as Messiah. And we are privy to the anguish he is experiencing as he writes this letter. It's important to keep in mind here that Paul himself was an educated Jewish Pharisee. He would have been brought up following those laws, going to temple and reading the Hebrew scriptures. Even with his faith in Christ, these practices, and certainly the Jewish people, would have been dear to his heart. But he had now discovered what life with a faith in Christ could be. And he is so excited, he finds it so fulfilling, and he believes that it is the best way to be in relationship with God. And so he wants others to experience what he knows, his relationship with God as a follower of Christ. Paul is torn between these two paths of faith, and he considers his family and friends. The Jewish traditions are important, but so is his new faith. As Paul is reflecting on the lack of conversion within his family, we too realize that we have people in our lives for whom we lament. Perhaps it is a family member who has turned away from the church, or a friend who has never known the joy of living a life in Christ. We may be saddened by what these people are missing out on, just as Paul laments for those whom he loved. So how does Paul resolve this tension? The way he approaches the issue, I think, is very sensible, and it's a, an approach that we should strive to mimic in our own lives. He starts with the facts. As scholar Kyle Fedler writes, he begins simply by stating what he knows to be true. As we read last week, Paul is convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. To him, this is a fact. It is truth. There is nothing that can separate us from God's love. A second fact found in our passage today is that they are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs. Throughout the Hebrew Bible, the Jewish people, the Israelites, were God's chosen people. God made promises to them, and they made promises to God. They were in covenant together and would be throughout history. Paul also states the fact that Jesus himself was Jewish when he writes, From them, according to the flesh, comes the Messiah. Paul knows that God's promises are true, that when God says something, it is unchanging. And so Paul leans on these promises that he knows are true. Once he has determined the facts, as Fedler writes, Paul begins to grapple with the things that are not quite as clear, these issues that the early church was struggling with. God promised that the Israelites would be the chosen people, that they would always be blessed, that they were special. And Paul has to rely on that promise. 
Paul determines he has to believe that God will take care of the Jewish people. And the comforting part, I think, the part that we can learn from is that all of this is about God and not us. All of this is theology, that is, it is the study of God. This is Paul working out what God is doing, not what we are doing. And we can take comfort in that fact that God is in charge. This directly ties into our understanding of grace as United Methodists. We believe in what is called prevenient grace. This is the idea that God's grace is always present. We have it when we are born and it is available our entire lives. Provenient grace is not dependent on anything we do, but it is a gift from God. And because it is God's action, it is always there. Provenient grace is the reason we practice infant baptism, because it is God's action. It is God bestowing the grace. It is nothing that we are doing to warrant receiving it. Paul found comfort in his belief, his understanding of God, his theology, that God is not depending on us because God is in control. And because of this, we too can take comfort when we are lamenting for our own friends and our family members because we know that God's grace is always there for them. It is always present. And God loves them whether they know it or not. Now don't get me wrong, this doesn't mean that what we do isn't important. I'm sure that even though Paul trusted in God's promises, he still shared his faith with everyone. And we too are called to share our faith through word and deed. We tell people about what God is doing in our lives, and we show our faith through our actions, through those tasks that we have considered each week as we have studied Romans, those tasks that we have been inspired by the Holy Spirit to do. I think Paul shows his trust in God's control that it is God who provides the grace for people to accept in the conclusion to this passage where he simply writes, God be blessed forever. There is trust and comfort in those words. May we too live our lives inspired by the Holy Spirit to share our faith through word and deed while trusting in God's grace, available to all, and know that God loves and cares for all people, whether they know it or not. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.